somewhat more formal way uh, and discussing um, how that can be generalized to uh, specify agent uh, parameters, what are called parameters, which simultaneously specify more or less static assumptions about an agent as well as uh, uh, communicate um, those assumptions from an enclosing object to an enclosed object. It could be to an agent, it could be to the main class, an instance in the main class of the model. Um, and uh, we're also going to talk within today's lecture uh, more broadly about um, describing the behavior of agents using state charts. We're going, we're going to then build on that by describing uh, a certain type of triggered um, transition within state charts, uh, triggering by a message. And we're going to be then discussing inter-agent interactions via messaging. How agents uh, communicate with one another, influence one another using messages. It's not the only way agents can influence one another in any logic, but it's the most common one um, within, within agent-based models. Um, however, we're going to start with a lecture on, on um, uh, properties uh, of agents. Um, uh, it was brought to my attention at the end of last lecture that um, some people had some challenges with the model that we built up within class. Um, so one or two people had a uh, problem that uh, they came to me with and, and uh, we were able to narrow it down uh, to a misunderstanding regarding um, what belongs in what class of a project. So do you remember last time the model we built up, it had two what we call classes in it, two of these these molds that specify um, specify the, the properties and the behavior of different parts of the system. What were those two classes? Anyone remember? Two main classes? One of them was an agent class called person. Do you remember that? The other was a class called main. And it had an, an environment, but it was it was a class called main. And um, one thing that I, I didn't stress last time, and I probably should have emphasized more, was when we go and we modify a model, we have to be very careful to be clear about and be conscious about when we are changing a model, which of those two we're changing. Because the interface of any logic allows you to, to access either of them in a in pretty similar fashion. So if you're changing main, you can add things into main. You can add a, uh, a circle, an oval, a, a line into main, or you can add it into person. The semantics of it, the meaning of each of those, of those changes is quite different, depending on whether you do it for main or, or for person. And so um, I'm going to try to highlight in uh, today's lecture and subsequent lectures which ones of these we're modifying at a given time. So, because it's awful easy just to start with what's on your screen and add it in there. Because it looks kind of like what I'm doing, but you're going get to get very different results. So um, we're going to have to be very careful about when we're modifying one class, when we're modifying another. All the more so when we have more classes yet. So it turns out that we may have sometimes multiple agent classes. We'll have uh, doctors and patients, or we'll have uh, both of them So we're going to have to be very careful about what we're modifying when, and I'll try to alert you to that. If you are still having any sort of issues with the model you built last time, I'd ask you to go take a look at it and go reference the slides and see if you can uh, make sure that when you've modified something, you've modified the right class, either main or, or, or person for that model. Okay. Um, so. We're talking here about these classes, these, these molds, as it were, that, that um, allow us to specify uh, characteristics of different pieces of our model. The main class, which specifies what? What does the main class specify? What's the job of the main class in life? Environment. 
Yeah, it specifies aspects of the context of the environment, both sort of a global environment as well as a local, more localized environment surrounding an agent. So we could have agents in networks, and we define those networks in an environment object, which lives in, in me. Um, it can also capture dynamics that apply across the entire model, maybe dynamics according um, that are associated with climate change, which apply across a, a broad, you know, spectra, a broad area of land, for example. Right. Um, the main class is a sort of stage on which the agents move around, um, and one or more populations of agents. And then we have these agent classes, which which describe individuals within a population, or or more generally in a multi-scale model cities within groups, you know, within a uh, broad population of cities as it were, people within those cities, perhaps provinces or states in which those cities live, etc. Now, any of these classes within any logic are what are called active objects. They're, they're, they're an active object class. And they can contain, whether it's the main class or these agent classes, parameters. Talk about what I mean by parameters. They can contain variables. They can contain actions, which actually specify in a, in a fairly declarative way um, uh, algorithms. And uh, they can contain al uh, events, for example, which trigger certain phenomena at certain points. And uh, components which, which uh, give them some presence on the screen during the running of a model. So uh, those circles and those lines we saw last time are all presentation elements. And those allow a given object, say a given agent, to have some, some presence on the screen. Or main can have a presence on a screen with slider bars and, and maybe some space in which the agents are moving around, etc. So I want to talk about each of these components. And then and, and this is mostly going to focus for the next uh, little bit on a more static description of, of these, uh, these classes, a more static description of what information is stored there and how do we store that information. We're going to be talking about parameters and values. That has to do with the state and characteristics, the properties of each of these. And then we're going to talk about the behavioral side, state charts, messaging all today. So I'm going to start with parameters. Parameters are best used to describe static quantities within the model. You can, in fact, change them over time. But um, so they're kind of best suited to, and they're best designed to be used with, with quantities that are more or less static, that, that describe assumptions um, regarding um, some component of the model. Maybe it's an agent. Maybe it's maybe it's at the main level, so assumptions that apply across the entire entire model, and um, they simultaneously serve two big goals. One is to define constants that that specify these assumptions. So maybe it's the income level of a given agent, or the weight of that agent, the height. Perhaps weight is not a great a great example because that changes very quickly. But perhaps the height for an adult, or perhaps um, uh, perhaps someone's uh, sex or ethnicity. Quantities that are more more static. So they define constants to represent these assumptions. And second of all, and this this will become more and more important to you at an operational level. By defining a parameter associated with these things compared to a, a variable, which can also hold values, as we'll see. The parameter provides a mechanism in any logic to communicate that value, that assumption, to this component of the model. So if we have agents that have an income parameter, as, as we defined last time. Do you remember that thing where we added in that income parameter? By having, by virtue of having that, the enclosing object, main, can then specify the value to assume for that parameter. Um, it can't do that for variables, for arbitrary variables, but it can for parameters. So we'll come back to that. Now, in Java, in, in any logic 
using Java sort of inherits this property. These parameters can have what are called types. And this notion of type is something that we're going to explore richly in a separate context besides this lecture. But you can think of a, a type as describing the sort of kind of thing, the kind of information that's associated to a type. To say a parameter has a type, a type describes the sort of information that's stored by the parameter. Maybe that type is, for example, an integer. It's, it could be a, a whole number, it could be negative, in, 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 um, but it's always a, an even number or a, a, a round quantity. So to speak. It could be a double precision value, a value that um, you know, is uh, 3.1415926, etc. Um, it could be a Boolean, something that's either true or false. So we might have a parameter that specifies, for, some, uh, for example, whether someone is infected or not. True, they've been infected or infected ever before. True, they've been infected before. False, if not. So we can associate parameters with these. And parameters will have types. And we have latitude to determine what type they have. And we're going to, in general, specify those. And that raises the issue of how we want to encode information. For example, sex. How do we how do we describe sex? Do we have an is male or is female sort of uh, parameter, and then it's either true or false, or do we store it as an integer where men are zero and women are one because women are greater than men, um, or do we store it in some other way? Uh, we're going to have to kind of decide that with our mom. Um, now, some parameters will live in different classes. Some will live in main, some will live in agent classes. For parameters in the main class, we can override the value in an experiment. For parameters in the agent class, we can override that value or specify that value in the main class or in the enclosing class. Okay, um, and uh, we'll, we'll come back to this uh, last point to, at, a, at a later point. This issue of parameters in communication. So I said that parameters serve two big roles. One is to encode assumptions. They allow us to store information that uh, typically constant that, is, that specifies some assumption about this agent, that it has a certain income, that it has a certain sex and, and income and uh, ethnicity or what have you. But beyond defining this, parameters in any logic are a mechanism for communicating these assumptions. And this communicating communication takes place from an enclosing object when we create the enclosed object. So suppose we have an experiment, a scenario that we want to run. When that scenario creates so-called instance of the main class, it creates, it takes this main class and it actually turns it into an object that can then run. Turns it into a real stage to be running with, with agents in it. As it's being created, it passes it parameters that say, assume this, assume that. Hmm? You can't hear that voice directly, but, but that's what's going on in there. Um, probably in Russia. Um, Harasho. Oh, specific. Um, okay, so uh, so that's uh, that's going on. We're specifying here from the experiment. That's the enclosing thing, and it's telling this main within it, "Hey, I'm going to create you, and you've got to assume this." And main says, "Yes, sir," and um, or "Yes, ma'am," and, and it gets created. Okay. So alternatively, the main class could have agent populations in it. Right? We saw that last time. So we saw this sort of thing. Hey, where's my any logic? Oh man, there it is. Boom. Um, so we had this main class and we had a population there. Remember that? Uh, um, here, when this population gets created, we're going to be telling. So the fact that this population is in main, it's living, ladies and gentlemen, in main. Air Jordan, I'm not. Um, but uh, this population is living inside of Maine. It, it is specifying the income 
at point of creation of each person within that population that's specifying the assumptions about the income of that person. And this is, in fact, the Java expression. And we're going to be running, for every person we create, we're going to be running that expression. And that expression does what? What does this expression do? Who can remember that from last time? It draws a value from the uniform distribution. So for every, for every new person being created, this parameter is going to be told what, what income to assume. And it's going to draw that value to assume from a uniform distribution. This is a value. It's a double precision value. A real number, rational number actually, but uh, it, it is a real number, uh, drawn uniformly between 0 and 100,000. Okay? And it's going to be doing that for each agent independently as it creates something. So that is this, uh, oops, of this point here. We have main. When it's creating an agent within that population, it's going to be telling through the parameters, assume this about your income. That income that we're specifying there is a parameter. You can, you can see it here. Within person, the parameters it's encoding this assumption about the person, but it's also providing that mechanism for main to tell it, assume this. Okay? Um, and from a collective agent, like if we had a city, if we had, or a farm, if we had within that city people, or within the farm we had horses. That collective, the city of the farm, would be telling each person that gets created within it, hey, you have this sex, you have this ethnicity, you have this income, you have this location, what have you. Um, and the horse can be told its parameters as it's being created. So you have this saddle, you have this color of mane, or this, this coloration, or what have you. Um, so uh, parameters are a way of characterizing assumptions and a way of communicating those assumptions from an enclosing object to an, to a, to an object that's, uh, that is uh, enclosed. OK. So last time, we built up this minimalist network of agent-based model. I would request that people open their model. Now, if anyone here does not have that model, or if anyone um, encountered trouble in building it. Uh, if you go to the class website, there's a set of models you can download, and that's in there. Okay, you can you could just grab it, grab it from the website, um, or you can look over the shoulder of a person next to you here. I'm also going to be doing this on the screen. Okay, so um, built this in. So here we're going to be adding in parameters. Um, to the palette window. Um, now, we actually added one of those parameters in, in the fleeting final moments of last time. So we want to add parameters to person, so we've got to be editing the person class, right? I'm going to be looking at the person class. So we added a parameter last time, income, right? Um, and we're going to be um, adding in uh, a parameter uh, in addition to that. So we. We did income last time, so I'm not going to do it again. But who remembers how we do this? How do we add this parameter in there? Anyone tell me? Click yeah. Side, yeah. Key thing is we have to click in. We have to go to the palette, and we have to go to the appropriate tab within the palette. And this tab is is actually in the general tab. So we're going to go there. And for this version of any logic, you have to drag it in. And I'm going to do it for the other parameter I'm going to add drag it in. Previous versions, you just had to click on them and then click on the palette. Um, so, so I have a name to use for this new parameter. I'm going to name it sex, OK? Um, so this new one is going to be the sex of this person, in it, and it's going to accompany their income. So remember, the income we specified last time. And you'll notice that it was a double value. So it was a, it was a real number. Um, and uh, this new value um, of sex, we're instead going to make it a an integer value. Okay, um, a real number. It's going to be an integer. Um, so down here, you're going to have an int, and 
that's going to mean that it's, as I said, it's a round, round number. Um, it turns out those are distinguished. You might think that that's just any old real number, but it turns out by saying it's a, it's a round number like that, we get a certain economies to which we have access. And so um, it's important that we say this is an int, okay? Um, so it's going to be 0, 1, or 1 in this case, okay? So, so this is an int. You'll notice that we have other choices. And we actually, we have a kind of grab bag choice where we can specify whole other classes. We'll, we'll do that. Okay, so, so we've added sex. And if we were to go up and look now um, at, at population, what you'll find now is that there's two, very, there's two parameters listed here. So what this is saying is within this population, as we create people, assume this for income, assume this for sex. If you don't have anything specified there, it's kind of deuces wild. You don't know what exactly it's going to be assuming. And maybe specified within the agent what value to use as the default. And it will go to that if it is specified. Um, but in general, you can have expressions here. You can have a, a constant, or you can have an expression and that expression will be evaluated separately for each agent, okay? So um, we're going to specify um, these things. So last time we, we had an expression here, and, and just so that we have something similar to these slides, I'm going to specify it again. So this is a uh, uniform distribution between 10,000 and 50,000. It's a little bit different from the one we had last time, but using the same, um, same general principle, drawing it from uniform distribution. And for sex, I'm going to do this thing called uniform underbar disk. Um, so the disk stands for discrete. DISC or DISC? DISC. Oh, DISCR. <laughs> thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Um, I appreciate you pointing that out. We're going to do some live editing here. Boom. Um, there we go. Uh, DISCR. Um, uh, yes, that's right. Um, now, we talked about how you could do that more, um, uh, more easily last time by having it fill in the values for you um, for the names. And how did we do that? Can anyone remember? How do we get it to fill that in? Yeah, exactly. Um, okay, so I'm here and I'm in person. And you might think that I'm going to specify these things here. But I don't. I specify them up in the in the uh, within the population. Why is that? Why is it that I'm not specifying those those values here? Um, suppose I suppose I were to specify that value right here. I were to say uniform between ten thousand and fifty thousand here. Um, can anyone see any trade-offs? This is this is in person. I'm I'm just showing an alternative way that has some um, appeals to it, but it has some problems with it. And I'm, I'm trying to analogize. So those values I showed on the screen just there, I don't want to confuse this too much, but I'm trying to make these values from the screen here, where are these being specified? In Maine. And they're being specified particularly for the population in Maine. Right? These values are being saved. For people in this population, assume this about their income, assume this about their sex. Why wouldn't I specify that? Students often ask me, why not specify that in, in person? Isn't, after all, we're talking about properties of a person. Why don't we use that as, as the default value? Um, why not just rely on that? Sorry? Well, okay, so actually, if we created a bunch of people with this specification, they would have different, they would have different uh, values for their income. It would actually draw each one from this. But why not, why not just rely on this and not specify it in the population? No, this, this actually, this is just... We're defining this. This is a, a variable. It's a it's a parameter, and and its value is specified here. So we could actually do it. The problem is it's not as general. Often we want different populations where people have different types of characteristics, different 
age distributions, for example, or different uh, distributions of by sex or what have you. If we did it associated with the person class and just relied purely upon that, we wouldn't have that measure of flexibility that we would by specifying it up at the population level. So in general, when we're specifying the assumptions to use, we're going to do so not here within the person, but we're going to do so instead within the, within the main class in, in the population in which that person is embedded. So here, I'm going to be replacing this by that. And this is a characteristic, in other words, of the, popu of the population, the, the, the distribution to use for the parameters in the population. Yes? So I'm wondering if you put it in the other place. Yes. So basically, pulling out, if yeah. you put it in yes. the, the actual parameter itself, yes. it pulling out a number from yeah. the home distribution. Yes. But then, what would tell it to change that number over and over? So if you want to. Oh, I see. Um, so in other words, if you wanted to impose a single number for the whole population where that single number is drawn from a distribution. Right. Okay. So um, it is possible to do that. Um, the, um, th there's a couple different ways you could do it. I'm trying to think about the cleanest way to do this. Okay. Um, and I'm going to um, proceed to utter what maybe... Uh, uh, what may be uh, viewed as, as techno, jump, techno jargon for, for some people in the room, okay? But there's a thing called static, static um, values um, within the model, and um, those are shared across an entire class, okay? So that it has, it, so for income, each agent has one value for that income, but a static quantity, so, it's, it's a misleading term, or it's a confusing term, because static we typically think of as meaning not dynamic. It's not changing over time. But in Java, what it means is it's shared across the entire class. It's, it's, it's kind of a global within the class, right? And um, that is something which uh, you can specify as a feature of, of variables within uh, any logic. So if you were to define yes. constants or any kind of yes. No, so what you could do is you could specify um, one value for that parameter that gets set um, to get set once, and then it just reuses that value every time. There's a second way you could do it, which is you could set up a function, which the first time it's called, it actually gets a value, and the second and the second time it just re and then returns that value the first time, and then later times it just returns the value returned last time. And, and that's actually very readily done. Um, I'd be glad to show an example of this. Um, it, is, it is something that I don't think we have in, 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 a, um, in a particular example in the class, but I'll see if I can create one just so you can see what it would look like, okay? It could be done pretty cleanly, but um, it could be done via a couple means, and uh, each of them has a little bit of kind of mechanism with it. Um, so I, I probably want to think about what's the absolute cleanest way to do it. But it can be readily done. Okay, um, Okay. so here I, I said the characteristics of this population are such that, that income will be drawn from a certain distribution. That's what this captures. And sex will be drawn from a certain, certain distribution. And we had uniform. And you remember through control space, we can have us have prompted with with values for this, and be drawing uh, from a uniform distribution that's between zero and, and one. Um, and we do that with a couple of these, but the easiest way is to say something along those lines. I did in the slides exactly, or if I did, okay, I say I used the value, I did this version of it. Now, I want to comment on that, just because people can get confused. When I did that, you'll notice it in control space here, and it, and it showed me a couple different ones of these, right? First of all, I can scroll around, and it will show me the documentation on each of them. So if I, if I need to know what they do, that's provided in this documentation. So this one, you'll notice it says generates a sample of the uni a discrete uniform distribution in the interval zero to max. Both zero and max 
included. Okay, important. Um, so either of those can be included. You'll notice there's another with the same name here, which takes two values. These are called formal parameters in Java terminology. Some people refer to them as arguments as well, arguments of this function. You'll notice that the function, the method, has the same name. And this is what we term an overloaded function. It has many versions of itself with the same name, but they demand different things, different types of information to do their work. This one demands two pieces of information, the min and the max. This one up here just demands one piece of information, the max, and implicitly it's assuming the min is zero. And then there's a, there's a third one down there, which is min, max, and then you specify a random number generator associated with it. So you can have your own kind of multiple random number generators, which is something you typically don't need, but 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 it affords you a certain a, a certain flexibility. So so here we have several different methods that can be used. We could end up using this one or we can just do it more briefly with that. Okay? But be aware that there's several versions of this, overloaded versions. They're overloaded in the sense that there's there's several several different sort of ones in the background there that, that you can um, you can get access to and, and uh, not just one by that name. Okay. We we had these parameters and we could specify the value associated with the with the uh, population and we can then run this model um, and we can dig down and go see within the population. So. We do this via this um, navigation. We've seen that before. And we can then see people who are in the population have certain characteristics. They have an income and they have a, a sex, for example. So we'll run this out right now. So um, right now you'll notice that um, there's, there's actually fewer things on the screen than were uh, last time. So I could, I could put back a toolbar there, but I just right click on that simulation and, and run it. What's called a build here. It's actually figuring out how to run it, turning into a form where it can run it, and now I've, I've got this. And so here we have this little bit of, of, uh, uh, of a network that we built up last time. If you go down to people in the population and you scroll around, you'll notice that these things change. Um, there are some people with different varies of income, and there are some people of different sex, zero and one, zero and one. And while you're doing this, it's showing their location within the network, right? It's showing where they're located in the network, who they're, um, how many connections they have, to whom they're connected. So that was the fruit of our little bit of quit out of this. Uh, so we've been talking about parameters. Um, now, we've been focusing here on, thus far on parameters for agents, but we can have parameters for the whole model. Mm -hmm. One parameter for the whole model. And this actually is a way that you could address Todd's Todd's question. You could have one parameter for the model. It's, if you only have one population of agents, that parameter could get a value and then it could pass that to each of the agents. Okay, so um, we talked about the values for the agent population or specified the population. We can associate parameters with the main class. And these parameter values are specified, ladies and gentlemen, by the experiment. Okay, they'll be specified, the assumptions here will be specified by the Closing sort of uh, the enclosing object. Um, and often we'll have model wide quantities like the size of the population to use, the duration of uh, some, some assumption that applies more or less directly to all the agents, etc. Like the duration of infectiousness to all agents. Okay? Um, so we're going to add in uh, a model wide parameter. And in fact, we're going to do it in deference to Todd's question. We're going to do it for, for two of them later, but um, we'll start with one. Okay, um, so what I'd like you to do is drag a parameter in and call it population size. Uh, again, in camel case, lower case population, capital S, says E. You'll notice I'm specific about the, the, the capitalization. Java like most languages in the so-called C family of languages, um, 
Java was inspired by language called C, which was invented in the 1970s. And, uh, and C has many, uh, has led to sort of a family of languages inspired by it. Um, and Java has many features that weren't in C, including an object oriented paradigm and a script out a lot of certain types of um, features that are, aren't needed and that are a bit dangerous, like unions, etc. But one thing it has retained is that, that it is case sensitive. Case matters. If you made this all uppercase and then you tried to refer to it as lowercase, it would throw up its hands and say, I don't know what you're talking about. Um, you, need, you need to be consistent about your case. Okay? Um, it'll be on your case otherwise. Um, okay, so um, we're going to go and we're going to add a model wide parameter. Where, ladies and gentlemen, does the model wide parameter live? In Maine. So we have to go, and here we're in main. OK, sanity check. That's great. OK, so now I'm going to go to parameter, and I'm going to drag it in. Same sort of thing we did for an agent. And I'm going to say population size. Boom. OK, that's great. We have a population size here. And <coughs> right now it's, it says it's a double by default. What should it really be? It should be a an int because we're not in the in the um, habit of creating populations with half agents and you might you might think that because sometimes we have stocks that count the number of people in population they have um, 0.25 agents but uh, or two pi people in quantity but here we actually want to track the count in, in a quantized way of the number of people okay so we're going to do it and um, uh, we are going to set it to a value of, of, of 100 as its default value. Okay. Now, this default value is used unless it's overridden by the enclosing object. So when I specify that default value within a person for the value of income, that would have been ignored if, if, if the population imposed the value on it um, you know, for using a different expression. So this default value is only used if it's not told to assume a value by the next enclosing object. We're going to use a value of 100, OK? Um, so uh, default value 100. You notice that it's in a slightly different version. This, uh, it's a different place in this version of any logic, OK? Um, so that's, uh, that's good. And, and then we are going to have the population size be determined by that parameter. How are we going to do that? So suppose we want our population, this population called population. If we want that size to depend on this population size, where would we specify that? Does anyone remember? Where do we specify the size of this population to use in the first place? OK, it's in the properties for the population. And where is it here? Yeah, this thing right here. So we're going to go down there, and we're going to say population size. I'm going to do control space so it can fill it in first. Boom. OK. Um, so now this is a this is a assumption about the model as a whole, population size, that's going to dictate, at an operational level, our this, the number of agents that are so-called replicated within our population. Um, so we're going to go see how that works. Now, where is the value for this parameter, population size, specified? I've mentioned it before, but where is it specified? It's specified in? Well, OK, the, the fact that there is a parameter, the parameter lives in main, but who tells it? what to assume about that. That parameter is, is there. It says, hey, you can tell me some assumption about population size. And by default, I'm going to assume I'm going to assume 100, unless someone tells me. But this is, this is, remember, it's saying that I'm making an assumption about population size, and it's saying there's some way you can tell me what that is. Who tells Maine what to assume for? The, well, yeah, it's called simulation up there. It's the experiment. And in general, ladies and gentlemen, 
we'll have multiple experiments, not just one. Here it's called simulation. But we're going to have multiple experiments. And they're going to each represent different scenarios, different, different uh, runs of the model that assume different parameter values. And that will yield, presumably, different emergent results, right? OK, so um, we're going to go and and we're going to um, go see how we can specify that, okay? So we, we already said, okay, the population, it has a size, population size. Let's go down to simulation, double click on simulation. And where would I go specify that? Where would I specify that parameter to me? Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Sometimes my questions are pretty, pretty, um, pretty straightforward. So that's where it is. So when you add a parameter to main, it automatically adds a field for it to here. And it puts the default value to use. It fills in that value. That's the default value you specified. So here, maybe we want to leave it as 100. But ladies and gentlemen, how would we specify? How would we create an alternative scenario which uses a different population size? Riddle me this. How would we specify it? <coughs> so, so, so let's suppose. So, for this, for this experiment, we're assuming a population size of what? A hundred. Right. So now let's suppose we want a population size of five hundred. Where do we go? Specify. How do how do we do that? Uh, let's suppose we want an alternative experiment where we do this. How would we do this operationally? Create a new uh, experiment. Do so new. Under right click on the project. And new and whoa, and we we go to experiment. Exactly. Um, we just want a standard simulation. We'll get into these in the appropriate uh, in the appropriate lectures. We'll say big population, right? Um, and. Uh, and we'll finish. I mean, not how I'd recommend documenting it normally, but that's adequate for our purposes. And then, in big population, we'll specify population size of, of 100, right? Mm -hmm. And now, if we go run big population, okay, we should see something different. So and it's doing this. And we may see a bit of a pause, but there we have, ladies and gentlemen, a bigger population. So let's be clear about this. We started with, with adding a parameter to the agent, which was, uh, well, we had income already there. We did that last time at the closing. And then we did sex. And the values for that were specified by main. <coughs> for, but specified by main specific to a population, a, a collection of people, this population aggregate that was there. Hmm? And then we added a, a parameter to main. And the person who tells main what to do, well, it's not a person, but sometimes we answer more class things. Um, the, the thing that tells main what to assume is the simulation or the, the experiment, the scenario, as it were. And, um, and then we can go specify in that scenario what to assume for it. And that affords us the opportunity to, uh, to specify different values. Now. Let us now go address Todd's question. Show, show one way of doing Todd's question. Okay? So Todd's question was, how do we specify? Let's suppose we wanted one value drawn from a distribution that's used for all agents, the income of all agents. Say. So that, that was one interpretation. right? We want, let's suppose we want agents to have a randomly drawn income, but we want it to be shared by all agents. OK. okay so. What would be one way of doing that? Can anyone think using the mechanisms we just we just explored? Well, okay, here. What's that? Yeah, we have a parameter main, exactly. So we drag over from parameter and we have, you know, um uh you know in income. We can we can call it income here, right? And 
we're going to then use that income to set the income of each agent. So instead of having this expression, what am I just going to type here? Well, what about, you know, what about saying, having the average income vary and setting a normal distribution? Is Great. That, is that okay? Uh, okay, I, I think Todd's question though, so, so yes, you could do that. I mean, okay. so in other words, you could have a normal, um, so, so we could have a normal centered on, um, on you know this value here. You notice here there's a, a, ver a version of normal where you specify the, the sigma and this is uh, the mean, right? And so you could have some variation around that income. But I think Todd was wondering about if you could have one value for all of them. Yeah, um, you could have income here. And then that income would be, could then be specified here by a single draw from whatever, you know, a normal distribution or a uniform distribution. And here, so, so I'm gonna do, you know, draw from a uniform distribution between 10,000 and 50,000. Now, but the semantics of this are very different. Before, I had income set between zero, and, uh, a uniform distribution between zero and 50,000, but it was different for every agent. Here, ladies and gentlemen, we're specifying a single value drawn from this distribution for the main, and then the main passes that on to the population, to each member of the population saying, assume this income, assume this income. And so here, if we run this model now, um, and we'll do it with a big population, okay? Boom. Um, so here we have uh, this. Evidently, we got a low value for the income because uh, the, the values of the of the um, qu of the, uh, of the, uh, the the radiuses are small, and uh, you recall we set it based on income last time. And if we go up, everyone has the same income. It's randomly drawn from between ten thousand and fifty thousand. It is just the same for everyone because there's one value passed in by the experiment that was then used for this parameter. So does that make sense? So that that would be one fairly clean way to do it, actually. So if you actually wanted to, yeah, yeah, I'll go. If, if you actually wanted to change the structure of it, yes. If you had a global, that would just be different models. So, so change the structure of the model. So, like you wanted so different state the, charts or well, something. Rather than, right. rather than having to specify in each variable or error er, in each uh, agent, right? If you wanted to pass that globally. Oh yes. That would actually be a change the structure of the model. Yes, and, and we'll in fact see models where that's exactly done. So in other words, if, if we had this situation where we knew for the purposes of our modeling that we don't need each agent to vary by income, we want to assume one uniform thing about them, you probably wouldn't put income as a parameter of the agent. Instead, what you would have is each agent ask main, say, hey, tell me what to assume for income, and it would tell it and it would use that value. You wouldn't, you wouldn't need to store it in each agent. We, we really only want to store those quantities uh, for those agents which um, could plausibly vary between agents. Other, otherwise, you can kind of delegate it. Now, th there's, there's a proviso to that, which is um, for neatness reasons, we might, not, we might want to associate with the agent class. Um, even though it's not specific to each agent, we can do that through static variables. But I'm kind of getting ahead of myself in terms of presentation. So, um, okay, so additional questions, so? Yeah. Yeah, I'm having trouble forming, but yeah. I guess you did hear something that I would consider normally to be a program that seems to work out, which is that you have two parameters in the yeah. that's within the population and one that's within the main. Yeah, yeah. I was, and I was, it still works, right? Oh, yeah. So, where does So um, this, this gets into a tutorial topic that I would like to cover in more depth at another time. But um, suffice it to say that um, uh, there's, we, we need to distinguish here between what's, what's legal and what's desirable from a standpoint, uh, a, a programming standpoint. Um, when we're building programs, there's a lot of things that we can do but we have to be cautious about doing because it can be confusing and it can lead to errors, right? Um, 
It can lead to a great amount of time to figure out what the model does, a lot of amount, a great amount of time to communicate to someone else, and a greater chance we'll, we'll get confused late at night and make a mistake, or take us a longer time to figure out the source of a problem. Right? Um, so uh, what I've done here is to illustrate a point is, it's a little bit of what goes by the technical kind of term, uh, quick and dirty. Um, but uh, it's, it, it, it is something which is taking advantage of an important principle here. So this income here, you know, I could have given it a different name, like uh, <coughs> global income or um, income assumption, you know, model income assumption or something like that. It would have distinguished it from the level of the, at the individual. But suffice it to say that the term income within the person class, it's, it's, it means a different, it, it refers to a different thing than income at the main level. Um, so um, I'm going to try to uh, create a, uh, an example of this. Um, so, so you might have in your model um, a, uh, two different types of, of, of um, uh, class, a, a class for two, di two different classes for different types of agents. So there might be, for example, a, um, uh, a person agent, and there might be a, um, uh, a deer agent, something along those lines, right? Um, and uh, you might have a, uh, a variable for each of them. Um, uh, in each case, there might be a variable that says, um, you know, um, something in common. Maybe it's um, their age, for example, or or their their height. Let's suppose height, right? Um, it's kind of a weird thing to imagine for a deer, but you know, might have a height. Now, height actually means something semantically different for a deer because uh, the way we measure it. Well, okay, I'm not an expert on deer. Um, but, but the way we measure deer height, I think, is with respect to kind of the, the, the crown of the head. And, um, and yet, you know, it's, uh, it's taken with both, both feet on the floor, right? Um, with humans, we have normally we stand bipedally to, to measure this. We don't you know, go down and <laughs> measure the top of the crown of the head. And, and, and so there's kind of some s different semantics. But we might want each of those classes to have a thing called height, right? And in general, Java has no problems with that because height in, in the context of deer we're referring to deer height. And height in the context of a person we're referring to person height. So we talk about the scope of a variable. And what the scope of the variable means sort of over what area of the program can you see that variable and interact with it. Um, so if I have a variable called income within person here, um, Maine doesn't know particularly much about that, about that variable. Uh, and if I actually referred to the name income in Maine, it would say, I don't know what you're talking about. I, I just don't know what, what's income. And, and there's a good reason for that, because I might have, I might have different, you know, I might have a, a patient and a doctor, and each of them has incomes associated with them, and I wouldn't know, you mean patient income or doctor income or what? So in general, we have, when we have one of these parameters, it has a scope, there's a set of things in the model that can see it and that can refer to it. Here, the, the scope of this income here is, is the main class. That's, that's the only things that can kind of see the value of that. The scope of the income inside of person is the person class. That's the only things that can see that, that, that income. And the point of interface is when you create one of these people, you can specify, you know, a value to use for its income. But, you know, if I got rid of this income variable, as I'm going to right here, boom, gone. Um, and I tried to refer to income as I do uh, right at that point we're looking at, um, right at this, uh, this point here. If I referred to income, and I, I tried to tell it, use income there. Um, we do model build. We'll attempt to say, check this model. Get this model ready to run. It will say, hey, income cannot be resolved. It doesn't know where to look for it. So in general, when we put some parameter within a 
a certain class, main class, person class. The only things that can know about that, uh, can refer to it directly, are within that class. Now, there is a way to kind of transcend that. There is a way to put a, what's called a qualified name that will let us refer to that variable, but I'm not going to present that right now, okay? That, that's something we'll build up to as we understand how Java expressions work, et cetera, okay? Okay, other question? Um, yeah. I think the quick question is just <coughs> in the example just now, if you have the same income for every agent, yeah. actually you don't need to define the parameter income right. in the agent. And, the, class, and, right? and that's what I was saying earlier. Yeah, right. Each, if you knew in your model that that was to be assumed, that you don't need parameter heter you don't need income heterogeneity in your model, each per th th you shouldn't, in general, there's no need to, to create that parameter in agent. Instead, each agent, to ask, to ask what to assume for, for income, it could just ask main, tell me what to assume for income. And main would, would say down to it, assume this. And, and it would then assume that. It doesn't need to store it within each agent. It doesn't need to keep it, you know, carry it around with it and, and so on. So uh, it's a very good point and it was, and it was that point I was, I was trying to make. But you know, sometimes like um, you might want to temporarily just examine it and then you want to go back to it, in which case you might keep it around in, 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 in person, okay? Um, sorry, some of that may, has gone over people's heads. I'm trying to address people with different levels of background, okay? So, um, okay, we're gonna go back and we're gonna do uh, the, the value here. So uniform, um, uh, and we're going to do um, 10,000 to 50,000. Um, okay, by the way, you'll notice this little X here. That's what it put in when it couldn't find what income referred to, to what income referred. And, and that's a warning that it can't make progress without us resolving that. Now we've kind of fixed it, and we can actually tell it, hey, take into account my fix by doing a build. The build gets this ready to run. We're, we're ready to roll. And, and now we can go and run this thing. Um, we can right click on this and we can run. And it works with, with respect to this, boom. Um, now we have a, a, uh, a population that is indeed varying again. Okay, so that's a, a glimpse of, of uh, issues here. Um, any further questions about that before I go into variables? So variables are going to sound similar, but they're not used to communicate parameter, uh, uh, assumptions. Okay. okay. Variables are particularly used for time varying quantities within the model. They store information like parameters. Like parameters, they have a type, an integer, a double, a boolean, a color. You know, or a reference to a person. This can even be a variable. So could a parameter for that matter. But these are various goals are particularly well suited to time varying quantities. Um, and you'll notice that some variables, like stocks, that's a variable, this is an example of a variable defined using other objects for by any logic. In fact, there are some variables that are calculated automatically by any logic in much the same way as variables within a, a, a stock and flow model auxiliary variables are calculated. Okay, um, and uh, if we want to have a class that, um, that maintains some information that is uh, squirreled away temporarily and it's changing over time, we, we typically do it with, with variables. And we declare that variable graphically on the screen. Okay, so, um, okay, so yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, Sorry, I'm just uh, catching up here. Okay, um, so let's let's go add a uh, a variable into a model. Okay, so we're going to add it into a person. So I have to go and make sure I'm looking at a person. Okay, here we go, and we're going to add a variable in. Oh my goodness, I double must have double clicked on that. I didn't mean to do that. Sorry. Um, so here's a variable, and I could drag it in there, and um, what sort of thing might be a variable? Well, um, perhaps an age, for example. Um, 
uh, or perhaps a uh, perhaps a weight. So so I might have my weight, and that weight evolves over time, um, according to something that's calculating it. Um, or I might have a variable that specifies, um, you know, something like um, my um, count of children or something like that. That might change over time. It's not something that is, is set up front, but it's a, it's a variable that, that changes over time. So, so we might have that, and that would be an integer or a count of these things. Okay. So this variable is kind of like a parameter in the sense that it has a, it has a value associated with it. But it's not used to communicate to this person. So if we went and we looked at the population, and we went to this population here, and, and we looked, um, it has income and sex. It doesn't have count of children. Count of children is not a parameter. It's not used to communicate the assumptions. Okay. Okay. So that's, that's variables. Um, those are the two big ways you specify um, sort of information associated with, uh, with this agent. We're going to next get into state charts, where, where, which also have some information associated with them. Um, but parameters on the one hand and variables on the other are two of the big ways we keep track of attributes of the, of the agent. Things which are static, more with parameters, and things which are changing. How we use them. Um, yes. Uh huh. Mm. Or, or you could have a variable at the main level. Sorry. Yes, they record attributes. Between uh, parameters and variables. Okay. So so again, parameters serve two functions, okay? Uh, the first I'm going to contrast um, with, with uh, variables, and then the second I'll contrast with variables. The first characteristic is they're used to encode typically s quantities that don't change over time. Parameters. Okay? They're constant assumptions, typically. Or they change very infrequently, okay? Um, but that's generally sort of the motivation with them. Um, Well, not okay. Yes, for the sake of that of the the quantity who's being told that. But for example, um, uh, you might have an agent who's being created with a parameter that specifies whether or not they had they were vaccinated upon child uh, upon birth with BCG uh, anti TB um, uh, vaccine and. Um, whether or not they are vaccinated upon birth is, is exogenous for the standpoint of that agent. It's, it's something that's, that's specified to that agent. Now, in the model, the policy with respect to whether or not to vaccinate and how many kids to vaccinate and so on might be changing over time. But for the sake of that agent, that's something that's told to it and never has to change its assumption about that. Does that make sense? So that's a very interesting point um, that you could think of something as exogenous with respect to a subpiece of the model. But, but that's the reality of it. We have pieces of models, and, and as far as there's nothing in that piece of the model which are changing that thing, even though outside um, there might be something which, when you know, new instances, new agents get created, it sort of sets different values for those. Okay, okay um, so, so one issue is whether it's changing. With a variable, it is, is often going to be changing. So your age, for example, might be a variable. Your weight might be a variable. Your income, in fact, might be a variable. Um, one hopes, when I was a graduate student, I hoped that income was variable, that you know, over time my income would change. Um, and uh, I'm, I'm happy to say it has. Uh, so uh, you know, uh, these, these are, are actually quantities which change over time. And if, if they're changing in your model, um, you probably want them as, as a variable. Okay. The second thing is that parameters are, are, are means of communication. They're means of communication from the enclosing thing 
to the enclosed thing at the time that enclosed thing is created. So when you have an experiment, when it creates that, that stage, the main stage, when it goes and creates that instance of the main class, it tells it, use this population size. It communicates through that parameter what to use for that. When that stage is there and we have to create each agent in turn, it's saying assume this sex and that agent, uh, you know, create an agent with this sex and, and, and that agent is created with that sex. It's communicating to that what the sex is. Now, those are the two distinguishing features in any logic associated with parameters, okay? parameters versus variables. Variables are not communicated in that way. You don't specify them in that way. So those are the two big things. Now, if you're going to ask, are they always aligned? You know, for example, could you have something you want to specify as a communication and you don't want it, but it should, does change subsequently over time? Should that be a variable, a parameter? Um, I would say I'd be tempted to have a parameter that's the initial value of that thing. Call it initial value of income or whatever. And then the income variable gets set to that initial value when it first comes into existence and subsequently it gets modified. And so the parameter will be named initial value of x. Okay? And it will be clear that we're talking about the initial value, not, not the value in perpetuity. Okay? Um, those are the distinctions any logic makes, particularly about these two types of quantities. Okay? Great questions. Any other questions before I go on to state charts? Okay? Um, that's good. Now, um, stop. Uh, excuse me. Mm. Didn't mean to do that. So I'm going to save this uh, recording of the screencast.